Thank you, thank you. I mean, uh, the pr <clears throat> they're closing the door already. I guess uh, we could go. They probably won't let anyone else come in. Uh, I think that the session is being recorded for those that won't be able to make it. Uh, so here we go. Just going to set a timer. So uh, I think we had about 14, 40, 40 uh, minutes of your time, including questions. Uh, so here we go. I am so happy to see so many of you here. Uh, this is my first time at DevOps Greece. Not my first time in Greece. I love the country. I come pretty much every uh, July for JCrete. You might have heard of this on conference going on in the island of Crete. Amazing place. Uh, Crete is a lovely island you guys have. It's, it is, there's no many things that I can see about this. It's just so beautiful. Anyway, so what I want to talk to, the, to you today is this topic called going beyond ORAMs. And a quick question, how many of you work with a REST APIs or applications that have to deal with REST? Uh, most of you. And I guess some of those applications have to deal with data at some point in your life, right? How many of you love going talking to SQL? <laughs> Just a few hands. Uh, how many of you still do store, uh, things like store procedures and PL SQL and stuff like that? It's fun, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So that's why we, we use ORMs, so that we don't have to deal with that complexity. And because we also, we will be able to use our own programming language of choice, which for most of you, I suppose, is Java, right? Yay, Java? Anyone using JavaScript or Go, Python, Rust? Yeah, there is a few. Yeah, that's plenty. That's good. Perfect. So my name is Andres Almeray. I work for Oracle. I'm a senior principal uh, product manager, but I like to call myself a seasoned sorcerer. Why? Because I love working with source code, and especially open source. Uh, here's a quick agenda we're going to see today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, relational data and what is the good things about relational data and the bad things about relational data, how we can do things with REST APIs also. And then we're going to switch gears into documents. Obviously, there is more than just relational data. NoSQL came about close to, what, 14 years now that we'll be talking about this? Used to be NoSQL and then not only SQL. So we got, what, document and graph and uh, vectors and uh, spatial and column-based, so many different formats, not just relational. But documents also have some issues. So then the next question is, can we have something of the two together? And that's exactly what I'm going to showcase today. And uh, it, we will finish with a, few, uh, a demo, uh, I promise a demo. And uh, hopefully by the end of, of this session, you will see, you will get a new insight of what is possible today and hopefully what other database vendors will be able to provide in the future as well. Okay, so of course I'm going to talk about the Oracle database. Everybody knows Oracle because database and Java and Linux and whatnot. But one thing that probably you might not be aware of is that the Oracle database, like many other database vendors, provide different formats in their the same uh, database engine. That means that it's not only relational, but you can also use uh, documents, you can use geospatial, graph, vector, so many other things. That's what we call the converged database. The great thing that I like about this as a developer, what excites me about this particular product is that I can use one language to query across the different formats. Yes, that language for now has to be SQL, but Look at this this way. If you have relational tables and you want to combine that with documents and JSON, you can use one single query at the database level instead of putting that at the application level, which is what we do today. So depending on your, your requirements, you want to do one thing at the upper level or at the database level. That's what this thing provides. Anyway, so when we're talking about relational, let's say uh, we have this trivial example of a tree tables, three entities that we can model. Now, if we're talking about uh, Java ORMs, the most popular one is Hibernate, and we also have JPA, Jakarta Persistent API, and we have what else? A Spring Data, if you're into Spring, how many people here uses Spring? Yeah, more than half of you. Anyone here uses Quarkus? Yes, uh, there's, uh, anyone here uses uh, Micronaut or Helidon? 
just a few hands. And you probably have heard that Gavin Kim has recently announced uh, Jakarta Data, which is yet another set of APIs that will provide more benefits to you developers. So with those APIs, you will be able to define mappings for these uh, uh, relational tables with uh, Java classes. So we have this kind of cardinality, we have many-to-many, -many, which we know is kind of like a little uh, uh, pain in the neck to deal with, and we have one-to-many or one-to-one. -one. There's plenty of documentation that tells you how we can use the ORMs to map our uh, models. For each one of these classes or tables, we're gonna have different properties that will be mapped to uh, Java fields, or Java types, all the things we know it, right? The important thing about relational is that we can have these links within tables that are known as the IDs, primary keys, foreign keys, all that. Perfect. All right. So the great thing about SQL is that it is consistency. Now, for every column that we just want to query, we just have to define those queries. So if we have a table board, I don't know, 20 columns and we only need three of them, then the query that we issue only has to define those three uh, properties or those three columns. That's great, we don't have to bring everything. Uh, so the, the thing about, the good, the bad, that's the good thing about SQL, but the bad thing about SQL is that you have to do a lot of thinking upfront. If you have, want to have a really good model, you have to normalize the model. That means breaking down everything into the smallest consistency in order to reduce duplication and that requires thinking a lot, then you have to deal with the DBAs, and then you have to have these really huge schemas, and then suddenly these schemas are hard to evolve. We know there are tools like uh, Liquidbase and Flyway that allow us to do database migrations. But still, you have to, to think ahead. How are we gonna move from this version of the schema into the next, into the next, into the next? How are we going to evolve so that we don't break our customers that often? That would be ideal, right? So that's the problem. It's hard to evolve SQL as we continue growing our application. It's easy to get it started, but as time passes by, the model gets quite stuck and strict. Now, let's, let's think about this very simple application. There is a, a conference application uh, where we have four tables. We have an attendees, we have speakers, we have sessions, and we have a many-to-many -many, uh, relationship mapping with, uh, with the attendees and which sessions we want to uh, attend. So if we wanted to create a schedule for a, a given attendee, it will look like the one here on the right side. It contains the data of four tables. So when we want to update this data, we will need to touch four tables. We will need to know exactly how many columns and with the names of the tables, all those things that have all the relationships together, right? Perhaps it would be better if we could only provide a single set of data and then send it directly to the database and that will figure it out magically, or hopefully magically, everything for us, so that we ourselves don't have to concern so much with the complexity of their relationships within all these different entities, right? So say, for example, that on the one side you have the relational tables, and we could extract that information represented it as a JSON document on the right side, right? So this looks nice, but it only looks nice when we are getting the data out. So many different uh, database vendors will give you these capabilities of creating views or some sort of processing at the database level so that the output is not just relational, but it could also be a document. Okay, so far so good. And there are many ways that we can do it. We can, uh, we can expand nested elements into the top level elements. It's up to you to decide depending on your requirements. Perfect. Now the good and the bad things about the document. Again, it's very easy to get started. We start with JSON, which is the most popular one. Or Who still uses XML for uh, documents in the data? We still have some of those, yes, but most of us have moved into JSON. Yeah, because it's the lingua franca of the web nowadays. It has a flexible schema. We can add, we can rename the properties very easily. We can add embedded elements with so much ease that we just do it, right? We don't have to think twice about this. That's great. But when we start adding more information, more complexity, more data into our applications, uh, it gets harder again to evolve. I mean, we'll show you just a moment. Because we have, we can, what happens when we try to normalize a document? Can you do that? 
Say that we start with a document and the one on the left. And we see that it's some duplication here because if there is an attendee that uh, has, uh, that's going to multiple sessions, if we have one single document for the attendee and the schedule, then we'll see all the different sessions, right? But we get a second attendee or a third attendee that have an intersection of the same sessions, that session information is duplicated. If we want to normalize the documents, then we have to have information about an attendee, and there is another document that has the real information an attendee and an attendee ID, like what is shown on the right side. And then we do the same for the session, and when we do the same for the speaker, what we end up happening is the worst of both worlds, which is a multiple set of JSON documents that represent exactly the same information that is found in our relational data, in our relational table. And then, we will have to find a way to make the relationships. We used to have the database give us uh, the, the left joints and the inner joints very easily because relational. But now that you have things at the document side, you have IDs all over the place and JSON documents, and you have to do transformations, and you don't want to go there. So JSON is very, very fast when you get started. Everybody gets it. It's really easy. You just get going. But as your application evolves, it starts to get in the way. Whereas relational, it's really, I don't know, a little bit cumbersome, perhaps, to get it started because you had to create that schema ahead of time. You had to do a lot of things upfront. But as the application gets more complex, you get all the benefits of that planning. It's just that it feels like we're dragging some of weight just to really get into production, right? So what if you could do both? What if you start with documents and then move into relational when needed without having to change the, uh, the storage of the data? That's a key question. So are we going to store in documents and then somehow change into relational? No. So what we, want to, what we are proposing now is have both of these formats together. So the idea is that if you want to start with SQL, that's perfect. But if you want to start with documents, that's even better. And as your application continues to evolve, then you will continue to use documents where it makes sense. But you will also be able to use uh, relational um, concerns when needed be or have that relational behavior. You might have noticed that I mean, if, you, if anyone here works with document databases, MongoDB is the most uh, common case, is that, yeah, it's so easy to store a document and get it out, and we got aggregates, and we can do transformations. How about those reports? Isn't that nice? It's not really that good, right? But relational data gives you, it's, it, creating reports in relational is quite simple. So what if you could supply documents to the database while keep relational information somehow, so that in terms of the application and the use of the interface, you keep talking JSON because that's the natural thing for REST, but on the backend uh, systems for everything else that requires reporting or relational data, you keep that. Wouldn't that be great? That would be awesome, right? Well, that's exactly what we are providing now with the latest version of the Oracle database. It's called JSON Document Duality View, a relational data view. The idea is you keep storing data in relational mode. That's it. You have columns of all kinds, with all types, everything that you have known from, uh, from years past. But you can also store a JSON in just one column, or there's a, a yeah. So you store the document into one document of type JSON. We have different formats. We have different ways to store JSON, depending on what you want to optimize for, for speed for reading, uh, for streaming, so many different things. But the point is that now you have relational data and document data living side to side. So here's what you can do today. You can define something like this. We have two formats, a JSON or GraphQL, whichever you fancy. And in the GraphQL definition, we're simply saying, hey, we're going to define a set of tables that come together and uh, this will give us that particular document view out of the set of tables. Now, from here, we're giving some information such, for example, for the first thing, the attendee, that is the table name that we're going to uh, target. That is the root of our document. And we will list all the different properties. We can give different names. For example, the attendee ID, that's the name of the column. 
but the name on the document will be underscore ID. And then we will have their relationship with the attendee sessions. This is the mapping table. Notice that that gets trans, uh, transformed as a JSON array of objects. What kind of objects? A session object that has some properties. And a session has a relationship to a speaker, right? So those are the names of the tables, the ones on orange. That's how we're going to expose relational data as a document. We can, as I noticed before, uh, list what are the name of the columns that will be mapped into the JSON properties. We can also tell what are the relationships with the other embedded objects. If we want to insert, we want to update, or we want to delete any of those relationships. And we can also mark embedded objects, such some things as a nest. That means that instead of having a deeply nested set of documents, we can expose those properties that are in one level down, push them one level up. That would be as the session having, it will be seen as the document of the session having a speaker property, instead of having an embedded speaker object with a name property. Okay, so we turn this. We now have relational data exposed as document. We're just mapping from this to the outside world. Yeah, I mean, you can do that. That's not a problem. But what if you could do it the other way? What if you can take an input document and insert data with that JSON document into the database? And that will affect their relational columns. What if you could take a JSON document as an input and update data, again, relational data? Wouldn't that be great? Such way that you at the application level don't have to do the transformations, so that you don't have to break down the document into its two constituent spots, so that then you have to issue different SQL queries. No, no, no. That's what this feature does. It does all the magic, all the groundwork for you. So the idea is, and if you're working with a REST API or a set of REST APIs, obviously this works for more than REST, but if you're using REST, they, again, you're dealing with JSON naturally. So you take a JSON documents in and can send it directly to the database. As long as the schema conforms and the validation conforms, you can even skip the validation at the application level if you want to. Because the JSON definition, the GraphQL definition that you saw earlier, is capable of performing that semantic validation. Not just syntactic, that is a valid JSON document, but also semantic, that it has the right properties and the right settings and the right embedded content. So if you want to, you can do, let the database do that validation. Or if you want to, you can also let the application do that. It's up to you. So, uh, so this is what I was telling you about. You can set a JSON document into the database and based on some additional metadata that the database keeps track of, they will know that the data that you're sending is capable of inserting a new entity or a new set of rows, updating existing rows, or deleting data, depending on what you want to do. So the great things about this is that you will be able to uh, use both JSON, and JSON documents and relational data as needed. You no longer have to think about, should I start with this? Should I start with the other? Should I know how to do JSON documents with a spring data and then turn that into relational data? Do I have to have different mapping models just because one is documents and the other is relational? What we're proposing is that you don't have to choose one or the other. You can use both if you want to. There is one thing that says that uh, there is no longer a need for complex ORMs. The demo that I'm going to showcase still uses, uh, and I'm going to showcase Macrona data for one specific reason I will tell you in, in, in a moment. We use in this demo an ORM for the CRUD operations. Why? Because the current crop of ORMs, Spring Data, Macrona Data, all of them, give you CRUD operations in a snap. It's so easy. You define your entity classes, put the annotations at a repository class, which most of the times is empty. You're done. How much time did it took you? A couple of minutes, you already know the APIs. It's maybe one or two hours if you are just getting started. But if you have to deal with non-ORMs and do all your mappings, anyone here has experience with JDBI? Or uses a Spring template with, a, with your own mappers? 
without Spring Data, it takes a bit more of time. It's doable, of course, but it takes more time. So what we're saying here is that you can continue to use that, but think about the other capabilities, the other possibilities, if you were able to send that data, that document data, directly to the database. So that's what we're going to say. Now, the question will be now, OK, Andres, this is great. We're talking about the Oracle database. I have to pay a lot of money for this. Uh, yeah. It depends. We have three editions of the database. We have the enterprise, data, enterprise edition, which is the one that has all the features you want. And this is the one that you have to talk to the CTO to figure out how many licenses. Sure. And then we have the uh, standard edition, which has uh, a bit less features, and the license is uh, not so much uh, pricey. And then we have the free edition. And all of them have pretty much all the same features. The enterprise is the one that has the uh, clustering and scaling, all those things. Uh, the free edition has almost every single feature. It does have the JSON duality views. So we, as a matter of fact, Oracle has published the free edition in April 14, 2023. GA or 23C should come in a couple of uh, weeks. Uh, don't quote me on the dates. I cannot uh, uh, say that exactly. But it's coming pretty soon. You can use this today. You can use this free edition for development, for testing, for production. Yes, you heard that right. And it's free. And it runs on Linux, it runs on Windows. It doesn't run on Mac, but you can use Docker. We also have the Oracle Autonomous Database. This is the, the, the database that runs on the cloud if you want to use the Oracle Cloud uh, Infrastructure, OCI. There is also options for you. Uh, there are paid li li options, obviously. But there is a free tier as well. We call it the Always Free Tier. This one gives you access to two instances of the autonomous database for free, forever, opposed to other cloud providers that will start charging you 12 months after you sign up, we won't. You will be able to use these databases for anything you want to. You have, I think, about 20 gigabytes of storage. You also have file storage for about uh, 100 gigabytes or more. You have load balancers. If you go to Oracle, uh, to cloudoracle.com slash free, there's plenty of information telling you how many of the free resources you have access to forever. I'm not kidding. It doesn't cost you a penny. And you can put it into production, and you get all these features. I mentioned that you can run these databases on, Oracle, on Docker. We have our own container registries. They are called the Oracle Container Registry. Here you can get the Enterprise Edition, on the Standard Edition, or the free, or even the autonomous version that you can use if you want to for testing. What you would like to test? Because obviously, if you have a database-driven application, you need to have some sort of instance of that database in order to test, right? There is uh, this. This version of uh, additional images uh, from this guy called Gerald Benzel. He's not just some random guy that decided to create additional images. These images are slimmer. They start much faster. If you run with these images as opposed to the ones from Oracle Container Registry, these start with 10 seconds, very, very quickly. The ones in Container Registry takes a bit longer because they set up much more data. Now, this random guy is not so random. He's my boss. He's my manager. He works for Oracle. He knows what he's doing. So we got OCI Oracle XC, and we got, I think, the, uh, the other one should be OCI Oracle Free. So Oracle XC is for versions 11 up to 21. And from 23C onwards, we call it OCI Oracle Free. So the, uh, the repository for that, just change XC for free, and you get it. And you might have noticed this, those QR codes, those, those QR codes are pointers to the URLs. OK. Why would you like to use Docker? Why would you like to, to use those kind of things? So does anyone here knows about test containers? Perfect, half of you. So for those of you that not, no, do not know what test containers is, I believe that Piotr is in the conference. He will probably talk about more about test containers. Don't miss his session. But basically, it's this. If you want to test out an application with a database, what do you do today? You phone in the IT department and say, hey, can you provision this database with these settings for me? And like, I don't know, a couple of weeks later, they will tell, yeah, 
Here's your server, by the way. Here are the credentials. Oh, yeah, it doesn't work. And you go back and forth until something works, right? But then it's just your database. Can you share that with your teammates? No, because if you're running your test cases, someone will get into, right? So now you have to get into multi-tenancy and other things and talking to the IT department. Again, that's not fun. It would be much, much better if you as a developer would have to have control of that database instance whenever you need it and with the right settings when you need it. It would be even better if that database instance will be created on the fly, on the spot, pristine, new environment, whenever you want to run a test, in a local environment or in a remote environment as CI, right? What I just described is test containers. It works for any kind of software that can be run on a container. It supports different languages. It started with Java and expanded with different others. And it has support for many different products out there. So all, pretty much every database that vendor that you see out there can be containerized, Oracle as well. And you can run Kafka. You can run RabbitMQ. You can run anything you want to. As long as it's, it's, you can put it in a container, you can put it also on test containers. That makes your testing experience much, much simpler much faster, more enjoyable. So if there are two things that you will take out of this session, first is that the, data, the Oracle database is, uh, has this conversion model, and we have this feature called JSON duality view. And the second is use test containers from now onward. You won't be disappointed. OK, so now I can turn into the demo. Uh, I ran a little bit fast. We will have time for some questions. So when I'm running into this, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, one question over here. So, sorry. Um, so the question is, are these views materialized in the database? These, the JSON duality views are a new set of views. There's a different kind of views, the different from materialized views. OK, so I'm going to turn into uh, my ID of choice. In this case, is um, uh, IntelliJ. And I said that I'm going to showcase Micronaut. Now, I know that not that many people here use Micronaut, but the good thing that I like about Micronaut data and Spring data and new coming Jakarta data is that the knowledge, the, uh, the concepts of all these frameworks are very similar. The names of the annotations, the names of the classes may be different and the packages, all that, but the concepts are similar. So if you understand how one of them works, will be easy to translate that knowledge into the other one. The other reason why I would like to showcase Micronaut here is because they are a little bit ahead of the curve. They already support, uh, they already provide support for the JSON duality views in such case that you can do the mappings with annotations. As mentioned, the Oracle database stores JSON in different formats. One of them is called the Oracle JSON format, or awesome for short, is a JSON binary format that is optimized uh, in certain ways. The macro data support for the Oracle databases is able to read that awesome format natively, such that it only transforms that binary format into the target type, string, number, boolean, float, big decimal, whatever have you, whenever it's actually needed. For the time being, the other vendors will look at the data that is coming from Oson, translate it as a string eagerly, and then do the mapping into the type. So there's a little bit of performance hit here, and these are our hopes that as we continue uh, progressing into the future, that Spring Data, Jakarta Data, and all of them will also support the awesome format directly so that you will have better performance. Okay, so what I have here, is your standard entities mapping. Again, the annotations may be different from the ones that you know, but the idea is that here, here's an entity that has an ID, and we have some validation on the columns. We got getters and setters. We're a constructor, yada, yada, yada. You know it. Anyone here uses Mapstruct with the database? Yay. Anyone here using records? Just a handful. OK. So here we go. Here's the real deal. Anyone uses Lombok with the database? Half of you, excellent, I'm on team Lombok, and I know that either you love Lombok or you hate it. There's nothing in between. Go team Lombok. Yay, please don't throw tomatoes at me. Okay, so all these entities, 
th there's just that, right? Just regular mapping, nothing surprising. And just like in Spring Data, Macronaut Data has this concept of repositories, where you get a lot of behavior for free. So you get these uh, finders, you can, then, you can get an update method, and a store method, or a save method, delete, all these things. Your basic CRUD operations. This is why we like these kind of frameworks, right? We just define the entity, we put the repository, we define what type of ID that thing has, magic happens. We love that magic, great. So how about that? Another thing that these frameworks allow you to do is that if these custom, if you can define custom finders following naming conventions. Like I think that a t-shirt may have one. Yeah, like this one. We have this naming convention that if we want to, we can add a new finder by a name property. This will map to the name column of our entity. But we can also add any kind of custom queries here. Again, the, end, uh, the annotation might be different, but basically you put SQL query here. Now, when you, I said JSON duality view and uh, you can use relational on documents, there is a little bit of SQL that you have to deal with, but hold on a second, don't leave the room. This SQL is not so bad. Look at this. If we want to upgrade one column, one property of the document, look what we're doing. We're issuing an update statement on the given JSON duality view. I'm going to show the JSON duality view in a moment. This is the defined by GraphQL. And this data of set here, this is the data column. This is the JSON column that contains your document. And notice that we can navigate that document just by using something similar to JSON path. And we can set the data just as you would do with any relational table. Here is the definition of that view, right here, which is just GraphQL. So based on what we have, uh, here we have the definition, oh, we have the definition of the student DB here. This is another uh, GraphQL view. This is just uh, for the student relational table. If we wanted to use CRUD for relational tables using documents, we can do it this way. We have some properties for that columns, right? And here we have a relationship with the classes. There will be a nested document. I said, I mentioned that we had two ways to define relational views. One is, I mean, JSON duality views. One is using GraphQL, which reads much nicely. Or you can use this, which is a bunch of selects and mapping the JSON structure. It's up to you. All right. So when we go back to that repository, we have a series of methods that will allow us to update or insert data based on the document. So for example, if we wanted to find a document by ID, notice what we're doing. It's a simple select statement based on that JSON path expression on the JSON document. And the same way you would do it for the name, you can also do a delete, you can do all kinds of updates. And finally, here's one thing that I want to showcase, it's quite funny, because the, day, the format that we're going to send data to the, to the database is, not, or at least from the application point of view, is a condensed document. I'm gonna send a student with just the names of the classes. But when we want to store in a database, we don't know, we don't want just the names. We want the classes objects completely, the full document of the class. So someone has to map an array of strings, an array of names of, of classes into actual class documents. You can do it at two places. You can do it at the application level. You can use uh, the ORM, or you can use, you do it at the database level which is what this thing is doing. We have a function called JSON transform, and you can use re uh, the rest is just regular nested SQL statements. To get document, do that transformation, and then uh, we, what we're doing here, this is getting the class object. Then here, we are doing the transformation. So we're getting the class by a name, then we're doing the transformation, and that's exactly where we're going to finally transform the input JSON document. This will be the following thing because I think I'm lost in you, I'm losing some of you. This is the document we want to send. A JSON document with a name, some properties, and a list of names of classes. 
But this cannot be stored as is in the database. It has to be a set of real class documents. So that's how I have put that transformation there. OK. Finally, let's look at the, construct, uh, the controller, which is, uh, let's do this. Uh, where is the controller? Right here. The controller, just like uh, in a spring, uh, you have annotations that will tell you how you're going to map methods to given REST endpoints, and you can do parameter mappings. This, uh, let's see when we insert a student uh, here. This is how you will insert a student using regular CRUD. We find, we try to find, uh, oh, we're going to update a student, as a matter of fact. We try to find it by ID, just using your regular entities and using the repository. If we don't find it, then we fail. If we find it, when you use regular Java code, set the properties, and then update, we're done. We know You know this. This is how you're going to do it in the relational view. Uh, we just pass a property. Because the update is done by the repository. If you want to create one entity using regular CRUD operations, then you create an object based on the input, which will be a mapping on Java classes from uh, the JSON input. Then just do relationships within the classes. That's pretty good. You save. You're done. We know this. But if you want to pass in directly the document that is coming from the outside world, from the application, your mobile, your browser, then just take that payload. And we let the database here deal with the complexity. It will deal to figure out, is this a valid JSON document? Is it a valid document that comprises with the schema, with the GraphQL view that we define? If so, it will do the right thing. If it doesn't, of course it's going to fail, and you can map that error to something that is appropriate. So this is basically what we're doing. Now, I'm going to run this application. Uh, where is the application here? Right here. Uh, we could run this. I believe that the database has already been uh, set up, so I should have a set of students already. I'm going to take this text right here. I'm going to change it to something else. Uh, where is TextMate? Here we go. Uh, let's put a different name here. Let's put uh, the box Grease, and we give it a full passing grade. Here we go. Right, so my application is running. I'm going to go into the command line and then issue this call. There we go. We have the return is that a student as, uh, as JSON. But now let's have a look at all those students. So we're going to issue that. What I did, oh, well, sorry. What I did with it, we get, we get ID 21. Remember, it's 21. So we're going to do this and pass it to JQ. And those are the JSON documents coming directly from the database. This is not Micronaut data transforming data from JSON into Java back to JSON. This is the JSON coming directly from the database as is. We could take that document and send it into a put on a post given an, a rest entity point, and that will be sent directly to the database. Remember that we said uh, ID 21? Let's grab that. Uh, let's do this. This will be 21. And then we can do JQ. Whoop. What happened? Internal server error. I thought it was 21. Did, did I get it wrong? Devox ID 21. Interesting. Oh, a student. Uh, that's why. Uh, no, it should be a student, right? What's the mapping that I set for the uh, controller? Here we go. We want to grab one by ID. Um, just ID. A student. Oh, well, this is uh, fine by name, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, it's a students, that is, it should be this endpoint, students, uh, but for some reason it didn't find it. If we say the student and change the name to uh, what we said, it, we have find a student by name. Uh, do we, how do we set it? Like uh, DevOps Grease with a space? No, DevOps together. OK, so that should be DevOps Grease like this. Not found. 
uh, because should be a student, a student, and not doing it properly. There we go. Yay. If the demo doesn't break live, it's not a real demo. It's a recording. OK, so here we have it. I'm almost out of time, and, uh, but here we go. So you have more resources. Uh, if you go into this page, oraclegithub.free, there's a set of all kind of resources available to you as developers for free. No strings attached whatsoever. There's more information that you can find about the different Oracle products. Uh, there are, there, there's tutorials, there's videos, there's a lot of things, uh, and there's obviously also certification. So remember, if you go to Cloud Free, you can sign up for free forever for uh, this set of instances, and there is also the free edition of the database that you can put in development and testing and production. Are there any questions? Yes, over there. Hi, thank you for the demo. Um, you explained how um, you can enforce the schema of the documents um, that you write inside the database, but how easily can you evolve the schema? So the thing about how do you evolve the schema of a document? Uh, well, it depends on, on, on your requirements, but hopefully it will be in such a way that you will either start by first by adding properties. This is not just a regular document. And then you figure out that if at some point you have to rename or remove a property, that will constitute a breaking change. Um, there's, uh, there is no easy answer for this one. Again, it, it depends on how quickly you will be able to, to let your consumers know that the shape of your document will evolve, will change into something else. You might at some point start adding new entry points that will accept a different set of documents so that you will still receive the old documents in the old entry point and then you'll start to direct your clients into the new entry point. That's, that's possibly one way. So, so basically the best practice is to create a stepping stone, let's say, to, to, to both accept older formats and the newer ones, and then basically at some point you just transfer all information to the new format and just um, delete the, the old uh, endpoint. Yes, correct. And the good thing about this feature, JSON Duality View, is that your relational table might have more columns, but based on the JSON Duality View, you will be able to expose it with different document shapes. So you don't have to change that relational setting so, so much. It doesn't have to be so groundbreaking, so disrupting. It's just that the way that you put it, the exposition that you make it through the JSON Duality Views is the one that gives you that flexibility. OK. So, so I get that it cannot be done uh, on the fly, like when using schema registry for Avro. This is, this is what came to my mind when I saw this. Yep. OK. OK. okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Any other questions? Yeah, we have a we have a question here in front and one in the back. Hello, hi. <coughs> hey, do you have any constraint Sorry. regarding the size of payload? For example, if the payload slash document contains uh, an image uh, in uh, as a base 64, do you have any constraint to store it in the database? I'm, I'm talking about the, the size of, uh, of document slash so, payload. Uh, so the size, the, the size of the document can be very, very big. Uh, if you send the image data as part of the JSON payload, uh, OK, I, I would not recommend it. I would probably send the image as a different, uh, for a different entry point and, and store it as a blob and put a, a relationship, perhaps some sort of ID because you're transforming binary data into character data that's part of the JSON document. So it will be much, much bigger than expected. Doable, yes. Okay. I would not recommend it. OK, thank you. Uh, there, there's two more questions uh, on either side. And I guess we will be done. Uh, yes. Hello. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, I really don't like uh, writing uh, the queries directly on the um, 
on our on my code base because of type safety reasons. Yeah. Uh, so when I use GraphQL, uh, I have uh, the schema and I have a generator as a Maven dependency that generates the model and the DTO. So I use that generated model and DTO uh, for type safety reasons. Is there any uh, uh, like uh, uh, a solution like this for the, this uh, dual yes. view, uh, I love scheme. your question because this is exactly what Macron Data is, is leading the charge. Right now, I said that they can support uh, the transformation of the direct uh, binary format, but the definition of the schema is defined twice. One in Java code, which I didn't show, and the other one in the GraphQL view. It would be ideal if you just want to deal with Java code that you put all the set of annotations and during the bootstrap, that Java code, that those annotations get realized into GraphQL views, right? And they just continue. This is something that we, as Oracle, as my team is trying to, to get the point across with the other ISBs, with the other frameworks, so that we can have this kind of support. So that you, as a developer, don't have to deal with the schema twice, one in Java code and another in GraphQL or JSON. Just do it in one place and have it in a type safe mode. It's coming. OK, thank you. So uh, I have to close down. If we, I will be around for the rest of the conference until Sunday. Uh, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'll be outside.